Uh, good morning, dear friends and colleagues in Germany. And uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues and uh, friends in China. So my name is uh, Wang Jianbao. Yeah, I'm very glad to host this event. Uh, this is a uh, spiritual humanism uh, uh, online uh, seminar, and this is 11th event. It's a serious uh, academic event since uh, 2020. We try to uh, work together to study spiritual humanism versus secular humanism to find out the uh, some potential overlap at the restless horizon between among the Axial Age civilizations and other indigenous civilizations as well to seek a harmony of our uh, human being life. So uh, this is uh, uh, Institute for the Advanced Humanistic Studies at the Peking University, as well as uh, uh, World uh, uh, Ask uh, Institute, Beijing. WEIB, uh, is, uh, it was established in 2012 at the Peking University. I'm also a research fellow from Hong Kong Graduate School of Business, CKGSB. So today it's my big honor to uh, invite Professor Carl Hans Paul to uh, chair this uh, seminar and to give us a wonderful speech. Uh, his speech title is uh, Basics of Chinese aesthetics uh, is a philosophical and cross-cultural frame of reference. Uh, Professor uh, Carl Hans Paul is from uh, uh, Taria University, Universität Taria. Uh, Taria city is the home city of Karl Marx. So we are also very happy for this. Uh, uh, he was born in 1945 in St. Louis, Germany, PhD in East Asian Studies from the University of Toronto, uh, 1982. Uh, from 1987 to 1992, Professor of Chinese Literature and the History of Ideas at the Tübingen University, Germany. From 1992 to 2010, to 2010 sorry, uh, Professor Paul is Chair of Chinese Studies and uh, Dean of Humanities at the Turia University, Germany. Uh, the fields of research of Professor Carl Hans Paul is Chinese history of ideas, literature and the literacy, literary theory, ethics and uh, aesthetics of modern and pre-modern China in intercultural communication and dialogue between China and the West. Uh, Professor Po is uh, specialized in the research of Zhen Banqiao. Uh, he had a great book, Poet, Painter, and the Calligraph in 1990, uh, as well as aesthetics and uh, literary theory in China from tradition to modernity in uh, 2006. Uh, I don't want to uh, take too much time of this introduction uh, since uh, the speech will be very wonderful with uh, rich content. So I will uh, let Professor Carl Hans Paul to share his uh, uh, great ideas with us. Uh, by the way, Professor Paul is also the translator of uh, The Path of Beauty by Professor Di Zhe is the most uh, famous book in 1980s uh, for the complete one generation Chinese in that time. It's kind of enlightenment uh, for that generation Chinese. That's a great translation. Uh, so Professor Po, is that your turn to deliver your speech to us? Uh, yes. Welcome again. Thank you very much. Yeah, you can share your screen. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. 
And uh, I feel very honored to be invited uh, by your institution to give this lecture. I know about uh, the, <clears throat> the place uh, of your institution for the two women, all this effort. And so I feel uh, truly, truly honored. And uh, speaking in uh, uh, at Beijing, I should use a few First of all, I want to say a few words in Mandarin, but my Mandarin or Putonghua is not that good. You know that uh, most of the sy sinologist has Chinese wives, but I do not have a Chinese wife. My wife is from Canada. And there are also advantages of having a Canadian wife because my English can be good. So now I will speak in English then, but maybe in the future on other occasions, I can talk in English. Okay, let's just begin. Um, so I will talk about the basics of Chinese aesthetics. I will discuss the philosophical background and uh, some uh, cross-cultural problems with it too. Here is the... Um, content of my speech, I will first of all talk about Chinese aesthetics as a philosophical discipline. Uh, I talk a little bit about aesthetic potential of Chinese language, yin yang mm. thought, Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, and then in the end uh, about aesthetics in modern China with some concluding remarks. Mm. So first of all, uh, let's talk about aesthetics as a philosophy or also as an epistemic discipline. As you all know, um, the uh, sciences and humanities at universities, they're all up, set up by Western academics. Uh, mm -hmm. They have become though systems with uh, a universal, or one should say a global significance. All over the globe, we are doing studies of sciences and humanities according to the setup of Western academics. But uh, since this is so, since sciences and humanities are a uh, European invention, we are inclined everywhere to define concepts and categories on the basis of a specific European tradition. According to European, by now also, of course, also to American preferences. But we have to stress that aesthetics, according to European criteria never existed in China. It's, it's a um, invention of the West. Uh, and here we get into the intercultural dimension of our topic. When we deal with phenomena of another culture, we have to be critical. We have to exercise self-reflection because things appear similar but in fact, they are different because they are different contexts, they are different backgrounds. So what we have to do in cross-cultural studies, we have to make the background visible. We have to make the context visible because we're dealing with culture. And uh, I don't want to go into definitions of culture here now, but uh, culture uh, comprises, first of all, the language that we speak. It also comprises the cultural framework of myth and images that we use. Uh, the way we refer to literature, art, religion, and philosophy. For example, in China, you would refer quite naturally to uh, sayings of Confucius, or let's say to uh, poems by Du Fu or Li Bai or Su Hong Po. Uh, we don't uh, here in the West. We have a completely different uh, frame of reference. And this is what we also call the symbolic and aesthetic orientation. That's all part of culture. And this is uh, very crucial to any cultural identity. So uh, when we talk about traditional Chinese aesthetics, I just said before, it never existed aesthetics according to our Western kind of concept. Uh, a traditional Chinese aesthetics is in a way an invention of Western learning that reached China at the end of the 19th century. And it is, so to speak, a modern perspective on pre-modern Chinese art. Uh, 
when we look at it a little bit more closely, then we can uh, uh, see it as a specific Chinese way of inquiring into the nature of artistic or literary creativity. So traditional Chinese aesthetics, when we see it from this way, it deals with poetry, calligraphy, and painting. Uh, according to Li Zihou, this would be the narrow understanding of Chinese aesthetics. If we have a wider understanding of Chinese aesthetics, then we would also deal with architecture, pottery, bronze, uh, music, martial arts, or gardens. But uh, uh, I will not deal with this wider understanding, but only deal with the narrow understanding of uh, Chinese aesthetics. So uh, when we talk about poetry, calligraphy, and painting, uh, and also architecture, gardens, or whatever, uh, it is impossible to find common traits to all of these disciplines. But poetry, calligraphy, and painting, as the most prominent scholarly arts, they do share some common traits. And uh, for this reason, uh, that will be the background of my talk. <clears throat> uh, important is also uh, to look at the texts on aesthetics. How do they differ in the West from those in the East in China? In the European tradition, the texts on aesthetics are based on works by Plato and Aristotle. <clears throat> so we have uh, rather systematic discussions on the concept of mostly beauty. In the modern period that started uh, in the 18th century with a German fellow, his name is Baumgarten, uh, was taken up by uh, Kant and also by Schiller. <clears throat> These are scholars that you might know in China too by now. In China, on the other hand, the texts on aesthetics were not systematic discussions and also not on the concept of beauty. You had unsystematic writings. Instead, uh, we have writings that probe into the essence of artistic expression, artistic creativity, and often done through the medium of poetry. So what we, the texts on, on aesthetics in China are uh, often poems about poetry and art. And so this is quite different from the European tradition. So uh, to quote Shakespeare, uh, I will now teach you differences. Yeah, we'll see uh, the, uh, a little bit, uh, we will highlight the differences. <clears throat> First of all, let's look at the concept of beauty in Conf Confucianism. <clears throat> Uh, in the Confucian discourse on literature and art, there is no discussion on beauty. Beauty, the way we understand it in the West, is considered to be external decor. It is less valuable than moral content. And uh, you, you even have uh, uh, the notion that beauty in literature and art is something like vulgar, like su, you know, in, so you have somewhat con a negative connotation to the concept of a, a beauty uh, of a beauty or beautiful, like to may and but also to synonyms like hua li and yen and whatever. <clears throat> uh, in the early Confucian texts, we have uh, a, a way of equivalent of beautiful with good, like may and shan, that. Uh, uh, we see in some early texts. And it is interesting that uh, we also find this um, in ancient Greece, that beautiful is equivalent to good. And uh, Dr. Wang Jianbao, he uh, brought my attention to a, a, a quotation from uh, Mengzi, uh, where you have like the concepts of good, of trustworthy, beautiful, great, sage and spirit all brought up in a, in a row, you know, shan, qin, mei, da, and sheng, and shen. <clears throat> and here you see the context of a beautiful, like in the old text, it is something like good. What about in Taoism? And uh, here, let's quote the uh, second chapter of the Tao Te Ching. 
<coughs> All in the world know the beauty of the beautiful, and in doing this, they have the idea of what ugliness is. Yeah? So beauty and ugliness are connected in relativity. Neither one of them is to be preferred. Uh, now, uh, I will only briefly touch upon the linguistic roots of Chinese aesthetics, uh, but um, um, you know that um, in the Chinese writing by from its origin origins are pictographs and are ideographs. So we have pictorial aspects in Chinese writings. You have images in Chinese writing. And then you also have uh, semantic openness uh, in philosophical texts that philosophical texts, even like monks or, or, or Lun Yu and uh, Confucian texts, they speak through images. This is what we don't have like that in the West. And uh, you also have in the Chinese language, you have, uh, because of linguistic features, you have a tendency to form parallel structures like Dui Chang. You know? And uh, here I quote a, a famous uh, American Chinese scholar, uh, Fang Zhetong, he said that parallelism is ingrained in Chinese thinking. So this is something that uh, is so much uh, internalized that uh, you find it all over the place. And here only to give you an example of a, a Dui Lian by Zhang Fanqiao, like uh, uh, Wang Jianbao, he mentioned I uh, studied Zhang Fanqiao. <clears throat> uh, but uh, you have the, the one of the origins of this tendency to uh, form parallel structures is our linguistic features. But the other origin is the yin yang law, yin yang shuo or yin yang si xiang. Um, it is a mode of perception of the world to always to seek balance, to consider things in context, not in isolation. So put them always in binary oppositions and to harmonize these binary oppositions. That's important. And uh, this thought was, of course, uh, uh, influenced by the Book of Changes, by the I Ching or Zhou Yi. Uh, that you always see complementary relationships, that you see the unity of opposites according to the yin yang patterns. When you have hard, you match it with soft, you know, gang and uh, 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 ro, uh, ro. And mountains had to be matched with water, uh, fullness with emptiness, feeling with seeing, idea with setting, self and world, and so on. So always unite these binary. Uh, opposites. <clears throat> now, uh, what about Confucianism and Chinese aesthetics? Uh, there are, according to my view, there are two major topics. First of all, it has also to do with the yin yang uh, thought. You have a tendency towards balance or harmony. <clears throat> and a second great topic is uh, art and morality. <clears throat> Uh, what about the first, the tendency towards balance and harmony? Uh, very, very important in uh, Chinese thought is the way of the mean, zhong yong zhe dao. So uh, this in, in literature, in art, this, uh, this means that we seek harmony of form and content. Uh, like in Chinese, like the uh, wen zhi, uh, bing bing, uh, wen and zhi, like uh, form and content have to be matched. <clears throat> uh, this is not only so in the performance of rites, but also in literature. And the second goal is to have cultivated expression, uh, wen ya. <clears throat> So when you are the and uh, so for this reason, we find aesthetic topics in Confucian texts on rites and music. The music chapter in the Book of Rites, you know, the Li Ji Zhong the Yue Ji. This is like the uh, richest uh, source for uh, discussions on 
of aesthetic topics in the Confucian tradition. And so it is interesting that uh, Li Zihou, uh, he also calls China the, uh, uh, or the Chinese culture, the culture of rights in music. And the second topic, uh, like the connection of art and morality, uh, I will try to illustrate that uh, with certain uh, sentences that uh, the Chinese all know and uh, that uh, kind of illustrate this important connection. Uh, in, the, in the Chinese tradition, uh, literature and art was always seen as a reflection of the character of the poet or of the artist. Like you have the saying, shi ru qi ren, or shu ru qi ren, hua ru qi ren. So uh, it's um, art and literature is a reflection of the, well, the, the, the moral makeup of the person who created this art. And this is also connected with the second topic that literature and art is a reflection of the vital power of the artist, artist or the poet, you know, when it qi wei zhu. Then in the earliest uh, writings on poetry in China, uh, the book of songs, you have uh, the idea that poetry is a way of expressing moral intent. You know, shi yan zhi. So this is shows also the the uh, connection of art and morality. And last but not least, particularly from the uh, Song Dynasty on, like with the uh, Song Ming Neo Confucian uh, thinkers like Zhu Xi and uh, and such, the uh, Chang Yi Chang Hao, you have the idea that literature had to be uh, had to express the moral way, you know, when yi zai da. Uh, so this, these uh, notions uh, all became very, very influential uh, in the course of Chinese uh, history. <clears throat> but uh, to my view, like the connection between Taoism and Chinese aesthetics is a lot more important, a lot more fruitful in a way. Uh, of course, in the connection between Confucianism and aesthetics is important as well, but uh, the Chinese themselves have kind of dwelt more on this Tao, on, on those Taoist issues. And uh, what are the uh, topics in uh, Taoism that are important for Chinese aesthetics? First of all, uh, there is a certain language skepticism that led to a uh, poetic expression through images and allegory. <clears throat> a second topic is that a great art was kind of artless art. A third topic is that uh, uh, is, it circles around the essence of artistic creativity. And a fourth topic is the, the notion of Kung Fu, uh, the notion of practice and perfection. And I will deal with these four issues now in the next few slides. Mm -hmm. So first of all, the issue of language skepticism. Uh, you all know the beginning of the Tao Te Ching, you know, Tao Ke Tao, Fei Chang Tao. The way that can be talked about is not the permanent way. So um, it is also matched by uh, saying in the Book of Changes and the I Ching that language cannot exhaust idea. Yan Bu Jin Yi. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sages, they set up images in order to exhaust idea. <clears throat> and uh, what are the consequences out of this language uh, skepticism? <coughs> the consequences is that it's better to speak in images and parables, such as Zhuangzi. Zhuangzi said, of my sentences, nine in 10 are metaphorical. And also not only speaking in images and parables, but also speaking in paradoxes. So when you speak in paradoxes, then truth is in a way the same as non-truth. 
method as non-method. So uh, you don't get clear cut uh, uh, ideas, but you get these paradoxes. And in the end, you also get a tendency to not to say anything anymore, to silence or to say the unsayable. Dao chi buke dao chi. So uh, this is also somewhat comparable to uh, um, um, a, a movement in uh, European history of ideas in the medieval ages, the so-called apophatic uh, theology or the negative theology uh, for the ancient. <clears throat> they were also trying to say the unsayable. <clears throat> so poetic expressions, they were, uh, that was done through images. The images uh, are supposed to be a stronger way of expression than uh, discursive speech. So images and metaphors express things not explicitly, but implicitly, indirectly. This is the poetic expression through images and in a way of indirect expression, by way of allegory, by analogy. Uh, the analogy that you find in the traditional Chinese poetics was that the world of nature is in a way equivalent to the world of man. So you could use images of nature in order to express human emotions. So this is the, uh, the major uh, feature of Chinese uh, poetry. And the technical term of this Chinese poetics that you don't say things ex explicitly, but implicitly, uh, that's uh, uh, Han Xu. And in Sidong Po's Arsha uh, uh, in the 24 qualities of poetry, you have uh, a little poem on uh, Han Chu, and uh, uh, I, this is only the, uh, uh, um, I think, uh, a third of it, uh, but uh, gives you an idea of what he wants to say. Uh, in the English translation, it says, without writing a single word, get all the spirit and charm. Without speaking of one's misery, a passionate sadness comes through. So uh, <clears throat> in second, second two, he deals some more with in the topic of implicitness in poetry. Uh, important, according to his poetics, is the meaning beyond words. Uh, uh, this is what I call suggestiveness uh, with an English term, you know. You know, it's, a, it's another way of indirect expressions. So Sukung Tu, he uses some uh, phrases to illustrate this suggestiveness, uh, this meaning beyond words. He has uh, the phrase images beyond images. Xiang wai zhi xiang. He has the phrase scenes beyond scenes. Jing wai zhi jing. But uh, this not only affects poetry, but also painting. In painting, you have the notion of writing of ideas. You know? So you don't want to depict reality as in the Western tradition. Uh, you want to write the ideas behind it. It's already similar to the modern Western abstract painting. And uh, just in the same way, as uh, Sukong Tu, you have in the 18th century, um, Chinese scholar's name was Huang Yue. He wrote 24 qualities of paintings, you know, Ar -shi -si -hua -pin, just like Sukong Tu, Ar -shi -si -shi -pin. And there you have uh, the saying, the marvelous quality is beyond the painted image. Miao zai hua wai. So just like uh, with Sukong Tu, like Yan Wai Chi Yi, uh, or xiang wai zhi xiang and and such on. You have here miao zai hua wai. It's so, so a certain beyondness. This is what I call suggestiveness. <clears throat> Second topic is artless art. <clears throat> so we uh, had 
before the beginning of the Dao De Jing, like uh, Dao Ke Dao, uh, Dao. So the way the Dao is unspeakable. What we can get is only approximations to the Dao. We can only have ideas about it that approximate it. And one approximation approximation is that the Dao is by itself, so it's Ziran. Yeah? Uh, another uh, way of uh, approximate the Dao is that the, the Dao works by not doing, doing by not doing, not steering the course of things. So when we uh, apply these two notions to the concept of art, then we get the idea that unintentional or natural art is of higher value than intentional or artificial art, so to speak. Uh, so the Chinese of old uh, stressed something that was like sketchiness, uh, uh, an ability that is beyond technical skills, that is in a way artless, that is spontaneous. And let me illustrate that uh, here was a, a painting by Badash Hundred. And here you get this uh, sketchiness. Huh? And I also uh, show you um, painting by Picasso, he, he at one stage in his uh, uh, creative uh, history, he also liked to uh, sketch things like this, like here was the uh, <clears throat> bullfight. And uh, in the drums, we have a, <clears throat> a wonderful passage that illustrates this artless art. Who <clears throat> issue the issue? This is like the idea about the uh, Belsten carver. Uh, Belsten carver. <clears throat> he, uh, he uh, to writes here, your subject is but a mechanic. What art should I be possessed of? Nevertheless, there's one thing. When your servant had undertaken to make the bell stand, I did not venture to waste any of my power and felt it necessary to fast in order to compose my mind. By this time, Everything that could divert my mind from exclusive devotion to the exercise of my skill had disappeared. Then I went into the forest and looked at the natural forms of the trees. When I saw one of a perfect form, then the figure of the bell stand rose up to my view and I applied my hand to the work. Had I not met with such a tree, I must have abandoned the object. But my heaven given faculty and the heaven given qualities of the wood were concentrated on it. So it was that my spirit was thus engaged in the production of the bell stand. Yi tian he tian. Uh, that's the, the, uh, the important passage here in this uh, piece from Zhuangzi. So to fuse one's nature with the nature of the object and to create out of the unity with the Tao. We, that way you transcend technical skills and you enter into a mysterious realm and so a realm that's described with the Chinese notion of Shen. <clears throat> so the idea is that a masterpiece comes into being like the work of nature. And the, this artless art is natural, but it's artistically perfect. <clears throat> Here, uh, uh, I photographed it once, I think, in Lijiang and uh, Yunnan, uh, uh, a belt there. Mm. Uh, the third topic uh, was essence of artistic creativity. Mm. So uh, let's uh, recapitulate. Uh, the ideal in Chinese art, uh, uh, in, in Chinese aesthetics, is to create uh, uh, like the work of nature to let art be created by itself, uh, to create out of the Tao. Here you get the idea that the artist and the work of art form a unity and that artistic creativity is located in a mystical or if not mysterious realm. And you have three important terms in Chinese aesthetics that describe this mysterious realm. First of all, Shen, uh, 
uh, we have all sorts of uh, translations to Shen, you know, like uh, as originally like a god, yeah, so, so mysterious, unfathomable, miraculous. Uh, then the second important uh, term is Tian, you know, like made like heaven, like so natural as if the work had been created by heaven or nature. And the third important topic is qi, you know, also like uh, spiritual, but also vital power. So the goal is to achieve artistic perfection in a work of art, uh, imbued with vital resonance and was a life movement. Yeah. So qi yun shang dong. This is the uh, first law of Chinese painting according to Xie He in the sixth century. And uh, as to the unity of artist and the work of art, there is a, a poem by Su Lung Po about his uh, uh, cousin Wen Tong uh, or Yu Ke uh, that illustrates this. He, he writes, when Yu Ke paints bamboo, he sees only bamboo, no other person. Not only seeing no persons vacantly and far away, he loses himself. He himself is transformed into bamboo which endlessly is growing anew. Since Zhuangzi is no longer with us, who understands the spiritual power? Yeah? Uh, <clears throat> and here is the reference to Zhuangzi and to this mysterious notion of Shen. <clears throat> and uh, from Sudong Poist, there's another uh, quotation about his natural creativity. He compared his writing to, quote, a thousand gallon spring that issues force without choosing a side. On level ground, it flows abundantly and swiftly and can go a thousand miles in a day without any trouble. When it twists and winds in the midst of the mountains, its appearance changes with the setting and there's no knowing how it will take shape. But there's one thing I am sure of, it always goes where it should go and it stops where it should stop. So you have here a Taoist image of natural creativity, but you also have a, an idea of what is, will later be talked about. I will come to it in a second, what living rules are. You know, it, it, there is an, a, a regularity to it too, which is kind of natural. It goes where it has to go, yeah, where it should go, and it stops where it should stop. <clears throat> So uh, here we get to the topic of living rules. A great work of poetry of art is basically a living or organic pattern, not dependent on rules derived from orthodox models. It follows the rules of nature and these are called in the Chinese tradition, living rules, contrary to dead rules. Yeah? these works come alive by creating their own roots. And so you have uh, what the uh, famous uh, Chinese painter of the uh, 17th, 18th century, Shi Tao, uh, then comes to the rule of no rule is the ultimate rule. Wu fa zhi fa, nai wei zhi fa. And here is a painting by Shi Tao that illustrates uh, yeah, the inscription says, I think, uh, wonderful painting, I shut up. And uh, here I want to illustrate this concept of living rules by a, um, a quotation from Ye Xie uh, uh, on the cloud, cloud patterns on Mount Tai. I find this, this short little uh, quotation, wonderful, and uh, it uh, very much illustrates what Chinese uh, traditional aesthetics is all about. It says, within heaven and earth, the greatest forms of when, like not only literature, but just pattern in general, are the wind and clouds, rains and the sun. Their mutations and transformations cannot be fathomed and have neither limit nor boundary. They are the highest manifestation of spirit in the universe and the perfection of when. But let me speak of them from one particular point of view. The clouds of Mount Tai 
rise from the merest wisp, but before the morning is done, they cover the world. All at once, black clouds will mount upward and the natives of the region will read the signs by established rule. And they say, it will rain. And it does not rain. Then again, some clouds lit by the sun will come out and the established rule tells them, it's going to be sunny. And then it rains. The attitudes assumed by the clouds can be counted in the tens of thousands. No two are the same. This is the natural pattern of heaven and earth. It is perfect work. But let us suppose that the pattern of heaven and earth would be set according to a rule. When Mount Tai was going to dispatch its clouds, it would first gather the troops of clouds and hold a conference with them. I am about to send two clouds out to make the great pattern of heaven and earth. Now, you over there, I want you to go first and you follow him. I would like you to rise up, you next to him, you sink down. You should try shining in the light and you might try making rippling motion. You back there, you should turn around as you go out and come back in. And I think it would be especially nice to have you sort of roll over in the sky. This one is to begin, this one is to close, and this one here is to follow up the rear wagging its tail. If the clouds were dispatched like this and brought back home like this, there would be no vitality in any of them. And if the pattern of the universe were made in this manner, then the universe would feel burdened by having a mountain tide and Mount Tai would feel burdened by having clouds, and no clouds would ever be sent out. So this is the little quote from Ye Xie. I find that uh, quite wonderful. So I hope uh, you like it too. <clears throat> so uh, we have the problem though, that uh, when we just spontaneously do art, <clears throat> what we call primitivism, it that does not necessarily lead to great art. Yeah? Sudung Po uh, had already this insight, you know, that uh, you also need a certain training, you need skill, you know, uh, not just only natural creativity. Uh, Sudung Po has this saying, there is Tao and there is skill. If one has Tao and not skill, then all those things have been formed in one's mind, they will not take shape through one's hand. You know? Yo Tao, Yo Yi. So you need a, an artistic creativity which kind of um, enters a realm that is characterized by transcendence of technical skill. Something which is also illustrated in the Book of Trunks by Kok Ding, you know, Pao Ding, all the Chinese will probably know what I'm so you have the goal to fuse naturalness and skill. You need both. You need na nature and you need art, art in terms of technical skill. The question is, how do you get there? How do you get into this realm, you know, where you can transcend technical skill? And here the notion of Kung Fu comes in. Kung Fu, practice and perfection. So uh, you have to practice constantly. You have to also copy the great masters. That leads to mastery and perfection. That need, leads to natural creativity as the Book of Trunks illustrates in so many uh, anecdotes. So you have the proverb in Chinese, if your Kung Fu is good enough, you can grind an iron bar into a needle. You know, 只有功夫生, uh, yeah? So you have to practice, 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 and then you, it, your, your uh, art becomes natural. Then it becomes just like heaven, you know, Tian. And you have uh, anecdotes that illustrate this uh, Kung Fu. For example, uh, the Kung Fu of uh, uh, Wang Zhi, uh, the greatest uh, calligraphy of all times, you know, you all the Chinese know that he used up a whole pond of water to wash his ink 
uh, before he could reach, uh, reach perfection. Yeah? So uh, this is how, how much you need to practice. Yeah? And then here you get the, the Morche in, in uh, uh, Shaoxing. <clears throat> and then you can create a work like the Nanting Xu. Yeah? Then it is just natural and perfect at the same time. So the result of Kung Fu is that you have an intuitive mastery of the artistic medium. You just you you can handle it intuitively and it is always right. It is like second nature. 